Jujutsu Kaisen is a unique um, story in its own right, but I wanted to discuss today the idea of mentor and student and the theme that is paralleled throughout the entire story of Jujutsu Kaisen, and something that I would argue is a pivotal section um, for the narratives of both characters and the story. Um, today we'll be talking about every core mentor that Yuji has had throughout the series so far, which will be including Gojo, Tsukuna, Nanami, Mahito, Toto, Chozo, Higuruma, Kuzikabe, Yuda, and Yuki. These are all of the people I see pivotal roles um, in forming Yuji's identity as himself as an individual, a sorcerer, and a being in this Jujutsu society that he is thrusted upon and put into. Um, from the introduction of the story, we see Gojo as this pivotal role in Jujutsu society as a whole. He is this unanimously decided, unequivocally strong, unparingly powerful sorcerer. He is the strongest sorcerer alive, all-knowing, undoubtedly so. And to that degree, when he shows interest in Yuji, that is the beginning of him seeing that he has an ability to correct and change the world around him. He has an ability to save others the same way his grandfather originally told him he would be able to defeat people around him and surround himself with friends and others that loved him. He sees the potential he does have, and Gojo recognizes this and offers him a hand to continue living as a Jujutsu sorcerer under the moniker that he has to consume all 20 of the Tsukuna fingers and then be publicly executed. But with that, fight Gojo in a battle, because that's what he's longed for, someone to fight him. Now with this duality, we see Gojo as the modern strongest sorcerer, and even him claiming that he sees Yuji as someone with the potential, similar to Hikari and um, Yuta, to be able to even outright surpass the title of Special Grade. He sees them as being the future. That is his dream, to raise and nurture Jujutsu sor uh, Sorcerer of the modern day to fulfill and do what he couldn't do, which is change Jujutsu society and bring in a new age of Jujutsu Sorcerers into the modern age and outright get out of the old heads of the old ways of the Sorcerer lifestyle, which limits their mindsets and their growths. He wants to change that, and he sees it in Yuji with his potential of possibly being able to even contain and use Sukuna's curse techniques, and possibly even his domain. Now with his introduction, we do see his growth is fairly exponential at the beginning of the story, Yuji's. Um, we see his growth and curse energy consumption, is a fairly modern high amount of curse energy at the beginning. He fairly picks up quite rapidly the usage of curse energy, although he doesn't have a technique and a technique in himself. He has a very unique ability in the verse, which would be his Divergent Fist, which is a time lag between his Curse Energy, which he applies to his target because his physical body was so strong that his Curse Energy lagged behind him and the reaction time for his attack, which created two pronged attacks for him. This, as Gojo stated, was quite rare in a Jujutsu Sorcerer because it's not common to have someone with the Curse Energy efficiency of that have a lag between their physical and spiritual body, which is Curse Energy and their physical strength. So it's not common for someone to be so strong that they outright were faster than their curse energy being outputted and forced through their body. So with Yuji, it's an unconscious ability he has, but for Jujutsu Sorcerers of the modern day, I guess in general too, it'd be very hard to do because they would have to do it consciously. So it would have to be a verbatim trial and um, something they would initiate and have to cause themselves rather than something that could be done subconsciously as Yuji does, he just does it which is an ability he uses in his upcoming fight, what he did against Mahito in the beginning of the series. We see there that he is the only one capable of damaging Mahito when prior Nanami, his second teacher, wasn't capable of doing so even with his 7-3 sorcerer technique. He was able to subconsciously block the attack from Mahito, but he couldn't outright damage him because he didn't have an idea, an outline of the soul, which is the main ability you need to be able to counter and attack someone of the degree with a curse technique such as the soul, because soul manipulation is a very very powerful technique and there's very few people who have understand the outline of the soul, such as Sukuna because he possesses the body of a dual and um, reincarnated soul, such as Yuji. The two souls aligned and tandem together 
he understands the outline of the soul because of that, and the same is applied to Yuji. He understands the soul because he's living in the same body as Tsukuna. So with that, it shows that Nanami in himself also has a potential to grow still, but and more so, it's the ability to teach Yuji and show him as well that his limits are only limited by his own mindset. And we see that with the detention center. Before this, Yuji believed that he was strong enough to fulfill it. He, he, he believed that he could do whatever he could through his own shank alone. He thought he would become the strongest, which is a possibility for him. But we see very rapidly that a special grade curse, which is only a finger bear, was capable of this outright sniffing away his attacks, his cursed energy, his blade, his cursed weapon, and just outright slaying him. We see his limits. He's human at the end of the day. Even though he has superhuman strength, he's still that a human. So he is then reassured that he isn't as strong as he thought he was. He can't continue to grow. He can't save those around him because at the end of the day, he's weak. With that crucial moment, we kind of understand a better idea of who Yuji is as an individual. It was at that crucial breaking point that we see that Yuji has a goal but he doesn't have a concrete way of approaching and understanding and overtaking that goal. He knows he wants to get to that point of being strong to save others, but he doesn't have the means to do so at that point in time. And that's when, when he revived, Gojo stepped in, teaching him the Cursed Energy basics, teaching him how to facilitate his Cursed Energy, and how to learn how to control it so he doesn't shoot it out and overexert himself and lose his Cursed Energy through the battles. And then with the introduction of Nanobi, teaching him, the very basics of understanding and visualizing and seeing curse energy in the open world. That's a very vital stage in his growth as an individual because prior to this you have to understand that Yuji himself was a regular human being. Yes, he had superhuman strength, but he was never a sorcerer like the others were. Most of them were grown up and raised in either sorcerer families or with the knowledge that they had a technique or curse energy around them. So most of their lives were centered around the fact that they understood that, while Yuji, on the other hand, is extremely new to the situation. Less than a month of time of knowing what Cursed Energy was and Sorcerers and Curses, he was able to grasp understandings that would be on par with a later first year student, maybe even second year, within a month or month and a half of training. This shows his growth, but also the potential of his teachers being able to facilitate that. Because Yuji isn't the brightest cookie in the bunch, but he understands what's needed in ways that the teachers can facilitate that growth for him. When they have the opportunities, they will give him what needs to be pushed over the edge. And that is the vital role that Nanami and Gojo both taught Yuji in the introduction of the story. Nanami, I would argue, is more vital and crudent because he is closer in strength to Yuji than the massive gap between Gojo and Yuji would be. So Gojo is a very good figure to place as a gauge but is also unrealistic at that current point of the story because Gojo was so abnormally stronger than him, he couldn't actually accurately gauge and see um, the limits of Gojo. He doesn't understand what those are, but Nanami, he could gauge that. His technique is fairly strong, but with his base strength, he's around his level so he can gauge on that and understand the level of power that a great one sorcerer would be. And he can use that as a goalpost to get to his level, to surpass that level, and to try and improve himself to continue and grow, to not only protect himself but those around him, which is the goal he wants at the end of the day. He wants to be able to protect those and save the people that are important to him. Nanami facilitates this not only by showing and proving it in the fight prior with Mahito, that in order to go and improve himself, he needs to be able to conquer Mahito, he needs to be able to damage his soul, and we see that he does once he arrives to the school right after the death of Junpei, which is also a crucial, crucial point in the story. This is where we learn of Mahito, his depth, his evil, his lust for power, his lust for knowledge and growth. He's continually growing in both strength and knowledge. He's a curse of the human spirit. Humans are very, very resilient beings. And we see that in Mahito. He refuses to die. He refuses to give up. He continues to evolve and grow and improve himself as an individual. As we see with his domain, the idol transfiguration, perfect embodiment. He is a continually evolving being, the same as Yuji. There are parallels to one another. And we see that 
even though Mahito doesn't intentionally do it. He does want to see him improve because he learns that Yuji is a perfect mortal enemy for him. So inadvertently, he teaches Yuji how to hurt him. Yuji subconsciously is able to damage Mahito, his soul, because he has a vague idea of what the soul's outline is by living in the same body as Sukuna. But also, he teaches and shows him that since he is capable of damaging him, he is the only soul person in this world that can truly put an end to Mahito and kill him. And with this knowledge, we see in the growth and change in mindset of Yuji between originally halting and limiting himself, not wanting to kill the transfigured humans to understanding he has to. If he doesn't do this, he can't approve and improve and go further beyond his goal because his goal is to kill curses at the end of the day. He wants to save the people. He can't do that if he limits himself to not attacking and killing the transfigured humans, which are already begun and past the threshold of saving. So we see that pivotal line that Yuji has to cross in order to truly surpass both Nanami and Mahito in order to truly defeat him. That is where I see the growth, the biggest growth and step that we see in Yuji in early Jutsu Kaisen. Mahito, Nanami, Gojo thus far have been monikers if you want to put them in that way. They're benchmark goalposts. And as I said before, Gojo is a higher bench, but Nanami and Mahito are closer benchmarks for Yuji, but still far away. But you can see the growths and the adaptations he gains to get to the point eventually. Now, with this, we go into the Kyoto School Exchange event, where we introduce to Toto, which will be next, the future mentor to Yuji. He also plays a very, very crucial vital role. Um, with him, I would say argue for this point forward in the story, he would be the second most important teacher to Yuji, right behind Nanami in terms of his curse energy output, his efficiency, and the abilities to fully facilitate his growth and abilities and curse energy and his strength in tandem. With the introduction of Toto, we learn that Yuji, to this point forward, wasn't fully utilizing his curse energy, his output, and his efficiency. Toto represents kind of like the peak power, same as Nanami. He is the, um, the figure that you would think of as what a grade one sorcerer should be in scale and power, physique, abilities. They both are the pinnacle and the basic status quo of what a grade one sorcerer should look like. That's what the average sorcerer should be. The strongest that you can get normally would be grade one, special grades are outliers. So those two represent the goalposts that Yuji should be having at this point. And he's approaching there, but not quite there all the way. So with the Kyoto uh, Exchange School event, we see with Toto, that he is basically just a better version of Yuji at this point of the story. His growth, his curse energy, his total power, we learn of him defeating special grade curse spirits during the night parade of 100 demons, almost soloing half of that horde. So we understand he is a monster in his own right, but he's also not so far out line of Yuji because he is a strength beast in his own right. He's strong, he's very, very powerful but we understand that he's not so far away from him that the goal isn't totally unapproachable as such as Gojo is in this case, but he is there and he's still a little farther ahead of Yuji. So he's capable, but not fully there at this point yet in the story. But with their quarries, their scuffles they have, they have two intermittent fights that are kind of joined together, but we see that there is growth there. Every time they fight, Toto is intriguing and trying to pull more out of Yuji every time they clash. Every punch they throw, he wants to see more strength put into his punch, more oomph, more cursed energy output. With Toto teaching Yuji, he finally learns the extent of where his cursed energy comes from, centering from his stomach, going outwards into every orifice and appendage he has. Darts from the stomach, goes to his fists his, and his kicks, his punches, all of it is connected. He teaches Yuji the importance of visualizing your body as a system, a flowing kind of unit where the curse energy flows through each individual body part you're trying to center, centralize it at and concentrate and focus to get the maximum efficiency of your punch at the perfect time section. And that is where he learns of the techniques of black flash. Now with this, we see a massive jump in Yuji's abilities. With each consecutive black flash, the user gets into a state of being, a zen state, a state of mind, where you're in the zone. 
your curse energy spikes, your efficiency spikes, your strength spikes, and your overall understanding. You get to the core of cursed energy, the core of your being. You begin to understand things that normal people wouldn't if they hadn't have hit blank flesh. And you get to a state where you're peaking to 120% of your total capacity as a Jutsu Sorcerer. So your individual limits are reached to 120% of your maximum abilities. So with this, we see him and Toto in tandem are capable of fighting disaster level special grades, such as Hanabi in a 2v1 and doing quite well with him landing 3-4 to four consecutive black flashes which is only rivaled by Nanami himself as a black flash user which is insane at this point of the story we see even Nanami with that point it, it shows that the growth is improving at a rate that I would say and limit to himself that it's continual, of course, but we see that Yuji is growing steadily more and more and more and more. He's adapting. He's resilient. He's not stopping. Every time he's set back, someone is there to pull him back, whether it's Toto, it's Nanami, it's Gojo. Someone's there to continue his growth and push him more and more to adapt and grow and improve himself so that his next goal is more in sight than it was the day before. And we see this. He almost gets to the session of defeating Nanami. Hanami, but she is then pulled away and Gojo tries to finish her off, but she leaves. But with this, we see that Toto is an excellent teacher for someone of Yuji's caliber. As I said before, he's not bright, but he's not dumb. He understands what's needed, and if someone needs to push him, he'll be there and he's fine to learn the hard way, because that's how he's always been. They have to teach him and drill it into his body. They can't just teach words, they have to hit him, they have to force it into him, and from that point, he understands. He gets into the zone, and he gets it. Toto was, and is, a, an amazing mentor for him, and we see it even more going into the Shibuya Incident arc, where we're introduced to also the Chozo and Kusikabe. These two individuals are also vital for Yuji's growth as an individual. Um, Chozo, it's mainly from the introduction that we revealed that he is biologically, um, Yuji's brother from Kenjaku in the past as Norto Shikamo, the original um, heir of the Kamo clan, and he created the death paintings. And with Chozo's knowledge, he assumes that since he is still a target at the Sukuna vessel, he is under the assumption before he realizes that he's his brother, that he is the enemy, he targets him. They have an amazing fight, each of them into depth. The manga was great, the anime did it even better. But from that fight, we see that they are fairly enclosed, and he is a special grade level um, cursed spirit. But since they are relative, a special grade spirit is more in line with a grade one sorcerer level of power. So from this point, from his introduction in Shibuya to this point, he is on the grade one sorcerer level, which is a very, very big growth in time, because it's only about two months time. And he's gained that ability and that power, which is phenomenal. It's, it's impressive. It's mind blowing. But he's continually growing. He is adapting. He gets through his piercing blood, his supernova, his stacking skills. He's beginning to understand that he's adapting, he's growing. His output's getting better as Divergent Fist is improving, he's hitting harder. And even though he does technically lose the Chozo, he learns from that encounter and improves and grows stronger from it. And then, inadvertently, um, getting the fingers, replenishing his cursed energy, improving himself to go into the fight against Mahito. And with his mind to fight, this is the true conclusion of Yuji's arc as a previous human, basically. But after this point, Yuji's never the same again. He never recovers from this point going forward. So that, that is the divide that we see here. So going forward from this point, Yuji no longer views um or spirits as people that are capable of being redeemed. From this point forward, after the Mahito conclusion in the fight, he is only set on one motion, one narrative, one idea, one goal, which is to kill every single cursed spirit. Not only that, but Mahito individually. He says if Mahito were to come back, he would kill him. If he's reincarnated, he'll kill him again. No matter if he hides, no matter if he runs, no matter where he goes, he will track him down. 
to kill and exercise him again and again and again. No matter how long it takes, he will kill every single one of him, every single curse spirit, and he will be relentless and ever-growing. This is the point where Yuji fully grasps his being, his role. He understands that he is a gear in the system, but he's fine with that because he understands his role now. He is there to fulfill his status, to kill curses, to continue to grow, and to save the people around him. No matter what the cost is, no matter how much it is, he will continue to improve, continue to grow stronger, to protect those that he cares about. Shibuya is Yuji's weakest point, his weakest state his weakest point of mind his weakest lowest low in the story shibuya is that place for yuji but it's also a state of growing because from this point going forward he is then acknowledged by chozo as a demon god his point and power after the shibuya incident are phenomenal at this point he would be the strongest grade one sorcerer outside of someone like Naya zinian someone of his level of course would be stronger at this point in the story but other than that, he would be, in my opinion, the strongest grade one sorcerer at that point in the story. Now, from that point, of course, he does encounter Kusakabe, who is also a vital role. Um, but it's not to the also total extent that um, Chozo or Toto was in Shibuya. He, he is there, he teaches Yuji inadvertently it's not totally um they're not paralleled i guess as they were prior to the story it's more so um like an outside interference type situation where he is there he aids he improves but it isn't so intentional as the um his mentors prior he's there to aid yuji in the cause of the calling games but he's not totally incorporated in it himself he is an outsider almost but he's there to aid whenever it is needed and i think that is also a, a very important role for someone of kuskabe's caliber he's a very strong grade one sorcerer he's underscaled he's undervalued but he has a role and that's set and that's important and yuji needs someone of course in the point in the story that's reliable still because he lost his mentor anatomy gojo was sealed Toto, he was incapacitated, his curse technique's gone. He lost a lot of people. He lost a lot of people he cared about. Um, Megami almost died. He lost Nobura, she was incapacitated. He lost a lot of people, a lot of people he cared about. His mentors died. So, for that point in the story, he needed someone to be there. And that's someone he gained in the Culling Games, and Higuruba. And even Yuda, Yuda helped save him, relieve him, and during the minor um, the second execution arc, which is right before the Colin games. He kills him and brings him back with a reverse curse technique. And we learn that Yuda is on his side. He was sent there by Gojo to save him from the execution and to be there for him going into the future because he knew something like this would occur. Now, Yuda is also a vital role, similar to Kuzukabe in that role. He doesn't inadvertently train him at this point in the story. It's later on after the Colin games arc before the Sukuna vs. Gojo showdown. They do have a two month training time skip, but before this point, he's there mainly to help him alleviate the pain he's, happened, he's had uh, thrust upon him in the Shibuya incident. And going forward, he'll be there to aid him, but he'll be in a different colony from um, Yuji. Now, going forward, the next main mentor would be Higuruma himself, the lawyer. Now, Higuruma is a very, very complex, very interesting character, but what he is there to help um, instill into Yuji is the idea that there is a moral gray. Not everything is black and white, there's a middle ground. And Higuruma represents that entirely. He saw an error in the Japanese law system. He didn't improve of it, he didn't like it. So when he was able to be given the curse technique and abilities he had, he had a rapid growth, a rapid change, domain expansions, curse technique knowledge, or uh, not reverse curse technique at that point in time, but he did learn it. He had massive growth in strides, and he was trying to retake and change the current system and the way Japan worked. And that's what he used curse technique for. He killed those he deemed unworthy. Uh, he penalized those that thought were unrighteous, unjust. So with his sense of righteousness, his sense of justice, he thought that what he was doing was just and right. But in Yuji's eyes, he still viewed it as death. He still viewed it as being murdered. And that's where kind of a duality between the two of them existed 
In Higuruma, he see Yuji's eyes that are still some they're still they're dead, but they're still white inside of him. He sees there's still some semblance of humanity within Yuji. Oh, in Yuji's eyes, he sees a broken man. Someone who lost what he thought was right. Someone who, who sees that something was lost within him. And that's what Higuruma is. He's a lost man. But he needed Yuji at that point in time. And Yuji needed Higuruma at that point in time. Because both of them were gauges. And both of them aided in their own gross at that point in the story. Now with the conclusion of the court case. Where Yuji accepts that he is the one that killed the people in Shibuya. He killed all of those people with the domain. He was the one that was in place, not Tsukuna. And Higuruma views and understands that even though he knew that Yuji didn't kill those people, he knew that Tsukuna did it. He was in such belief that Yuji himself truly and justly thought and viewed himself that he was the one that committed those crimes because he was there. In his own vision, he was there in the first person point of view, seeing all of those deaths occur when he was first brought back out of possession from Tsukuna. He was there, thrusted out in this open field of just destruction, rubble, and death. So in his own opinion, he was the one that caused those deaths. He was the one that did it. So he openly admitted to being guilty at that trial. And that left a profound impact on Higuruma himself as viewing Yuji as a, not sinless, but capable being who was there and able to, in a way, submit himself as being human. He had the humanity that he once lost as an individual, as a lawyer, who had to lie to the system just to seat the case and to criminalize and unjust those that weren't. So, with Higuruma, he sees Yuji as an individual of unjust, undying will, and he is there for that one cause, which is to improve, to kill the curses, and to save those around him. And he sees that humanity in him, and he doesn't kill him. And with those two, that begins the relationship between Yuji and Higuruma. And I see Higuruma as being the replacement for Nanami that Yuji needed at that point in the story. He needed a mentor. He needed someone of older, more experienced life to be there and guide him at that point in time. Because he lost the man previously that had that role and that purpose for him. So Higuruma was there to fill the void. Even though it was temporarily from the story, he was there to be that next mentor, that next person to aid Yuji along his life as a Jujutsu sorcerer. Now, it was short-lived from the story, because from that point, he did end up losing Higuruma, which was another point. Now, as you might know now, there is a parallel, and there is a connection. There is a um, continued plot line. There is a blatant attempt, I guess. As I said, there's a parallel. Um, you see it. There's obviously something at hand where every mentor Yuji has, almost unwillingly, undoubtedly, um, either dies or is critically or irreversibly removed from the story to further his own growth as an individual and his own personal, um, basically terror, his turmoil that he has to deal with to grow as an individual as a sorcerer to understand that he will always end up being alone no matter how hard he tries. There will be, never be someone there for him always. So we, we see that quite blatantly. Um, he lost his first mentor in Nanami. He then lost his mentor in Gojo dying. He then lost Higuruma. He's lost every main mentor he has had up to, to that point into the story. And I mainly wanted to draw on that for, um, for this video. I, I just wanted to bring to light that there is a narrative there. Um, and I think it speaks to Yuji as an individual. Um, as his grandpa said at the beginning of the story, he told him not to die a lonely man such as himself and to surround himself with people that cared and loved about him so that when he dies, he has those around him, unlike himself. Now, for me, 
um, from what Gage said originally, that Yuji really had two paths at the end of the story. It was either he saved everyone and he dies, or everyone dies but himself, and he's only left alone at the end of the story. And for me, that is the only real possibility I see at this point in the story with all these deaths occurring. I only see the end being Yuji being left alive and having to live the rest of his life knowing he couldn't save everyone. That his all of his friends died, everyone he cared about died, every mentor he had died, his teachers are gone. The world he knew was gone, left in ashes and turmoil by the King of Curses, Ryo Matsukuna. And I think that's okay at the end of the day. Um, I think that would be a perfectly fine way to wrap the story up, having the villain for the, one of the first times um, win. Sukuna winning, which is what I see. I don't see anyone winning besides himself. And that would wrap up Yuji's character arc because it would basically end with him realizing that there was nothing he ever could have done to stop what was coming. He could never keep those around him he cared about, those he loved about. His mentors were always fated to leave. They were always destined to not stay with him for long. And I think that's alright at the end of the day. And that's okay that Gage did that. And even though it does hurt to see those you love and enjoy leave, at the end of the day, you just have to be happy that you were able to encounter them, meet them, and know them for the time you did. And I think that's what we'll have at the end of the story. We'll be Yuji lamenting and remembering the times he had with those he cared about. Similar to the premature death arc, the hidden inventory with Gojo, lamenting on his happiest days as a high schooler. During those days with Rika, Ghetto, and I don't even think he was still there. And Shoko. Those is what he saw at his death. He was back in that airport seeing all of them alive still. And that's what will happen to Yuji at the end. He'll look back at the happy times he had at Jujutsu High before everything went into the end. And that will be what the story will hold. A parallel between him and Tsukuna at the end of the day because they are one and the same they both are tragic characters living their lives on two different sides of the same coin and that is what Yuji Itadori is he was a man fated to never keep his mentor to never keep those he loved to never keep his friends but he would struggle valiantly every single day to try and keep them only to never again see them again because at the end of the day he is a Jujutsu Sorcerer, and Jujutsu Sorcerers never get a happy ending.